work and research for the last seven years or so has been on trying to understand the experience of African American soldiers during the Civil War who were captured by the Confederacy and held in captivity. So what I will be doing today is going through a few things, talking about some of the uh, existing interpretations surrounding Black prisoners of war experiences, some of the challenges with really resurrecting what they went through, how to understand how many men were even captured, just basic knowledge, things that we really struggle to understand still and as a historical community, and some of my findings with my research and basically trying to understand Black prisoners of war on their own terms. So I'll be explaining how we have to go beyond prisons, uh, starting with Andersonville right down the road from here in Columbus, so I'll get into that in a little bit, and really reckoning with the fact that one has to understand American slavery in the antebellum period to understand the Black prisoner of war experience, that these men went through very particular forms of captivity, namely military enslavement, reclamation by former enslavers who had previously held them in slavery, as well as even sale, uh, in addition to being incarcerated in typical prisons like Andersonville Prison in Georgia, Libby in Virginia, and otherwise. And then I will also be uh, demonstrating the significance of Georgia and Alabama in particular, that the centers of incarceration and captivity for Black prisoners of war was not a place like Richmond, though Richmond was definitely significant, but instead the Deep South that the majority of these men who were captured, who survived, who were held to captivity in one form or another, were taken predominantly in Georgia and Alabama and held in Georgia and Alabama. And so the implications that this has for kind of shifting centers of research further to the Deep South. So that is where I'm going to start today. And I really want to start with kind of emphasizing some of the basic questions that I really had to push back against and work with when I first started this research. Uh, so. When I first started this, I actually had been working on Andersonville Prison and the military uh, commandant, Captain Henry Wirtz, and his tribunal after the war. And as I revisited this topic for graduate school, I realized that I kept running into some interesting overlaps when it came to discussing Black POWs, that there was consistent evidence that Black prisoners of war were at least somewhat significant in number, that they were present in prisons like Andersonville and Libby and in Charleston, but we didn't really know very much about them beyond certain perspectives, that once men disappeared from the site of the Union, once they disappeared from the site of their white officers, it was very hard to reconstruct and resurrect what they'd gone through. And I found that most historians were very limited by the lack of written evidence, the lack of photographic evidence, and basically the, the narrative surrounding Black POWs has been on mortality, has been on atrocities in the moment of battle and the moments of capture, and not so much on captivity itself. We've been able to find some things on captivity, uh, namely surrounding military prisons, in part because white prisoners of war who were held with these men gave witness to what they went through, but these are also highly circumscribed sources. These are men talking about Black prisoners of war and predominantly speaking about freeborn men from the North, men like the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Colored Infantry, uh, who had a very particular experience kind of situated in this legal limbo in prisons. For the vast majority of Black prisoners of war, as I came to find, their experience was more akin to military enslavement, that Confederates sought to re-enslave these men and treat them not as guerrilla fighters, not as appropriate soldiers of a foreign nation, but instead as recovered property, property taken back from the United States that had been seized. And this was the level that they were treated on. So when I first started this research, I found that there was a lack of evidence in part because the narratives have been so focused on white POWs and for very good reason. Andersonville Prison is one of the most notorious prison camps during the Civil War, in part because 13,000 Union soldiers died in captivity there in the course of a year out of 40,000 men held within its walls. And when they came back to the Union, the survivors tended to look like this, looked like skeletons. So there was significant evidence of what happened, not least because of written records, because of this photographic record. And in part, Black prisoners of war didn't really stand a chance. 
in the face of 400,000 white POWs, of 52,000 white POWs deaths, the maybe several thousand Black POWs really didn't have room to tell their stories. And indeed, Black historians from the turn of the century at the late 19th century really emphasized the narrative of atrocity at places like Fort Pillow, at the Battle of the Crater, and not so much on the experience of captivity after capture. So really trying to emphasize what Confederates did to Black POWs, rather than what Black POWs themselves were doing. So these all provided good starting points. I was able to look through these kinds of records and found that um, there were some instances of testimony that historians have found. Namely, there were four Black POWs who gave voice to their experiences in captivity at Andersonville. They did this in the military tribunal that tried the prison commandant, Captain Henry Wirtz, after the war ended, but these were highly circumscribed, uh, they were pretty short in nature, and out of the more than 150 witnesses called to speak at this trial, only four men were Black POWs held at Andersonville. But what they provided us was very illuminating. Basically, this discussion of being put to work, being put on burial duty, uh, building the fortifications, serving some of the Confederate officers running the prison, so these men were participating in the prison culture, but were seen as somewhat separate from it too, that they could move in and out of the prisons, that they had some treatment that looked a little different from what was going on for white POWs. But this was where I started. Basically, the few testimonies we were able to find, these instances of Black POWs, first-person accounts, of what happened, but I, I wanted to find more, see what was out there, see if I could answer basic questions of even how many men were captured. The highest estimates that I could find were 800 men to maybe 1,200. That was the highest range of the estimate. But as I poked through, uh, I began to find uh, further instances that also historians have, have found and identified including the official records of the war. If anyone's familiar with the official records, this is a massive collection of more than 120 volumes worth of correspondence covering the entirety of the Civil War. Out of those thousands of pages, thousands of accounts, years of testimony, there are three instances of Black prisoners of war voices coming through in the records. And these are two of them that I presented to you on the screen. So again, you know, these are present, but very much mitigated and circumscribed by the particular source that we're engaging with, but also quite illuminating and allowed me to read between the lines in some ways. So the 44th Colored Infantry really struck me as interesting because these two officers gave voice to the fact that hundreds of men were captured, Hundreds of men survived capture, were put to work on railroads, taken to places like Corinth, Mississippi. But then these men were able to escape pretty soon after capture. So when they gave their accounts, they had an idea initially of what this process of captivity looked like, but didn't go through it for several years like their compatriots. So I had to dig further and, you know, including these uh, testimonies, see what else I could find. And I started with the compiled military service records. And in part, it is the um, digitization of these records that has allowed me to conduct this kind of research that historians just previously have not been able to do. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what I was able to do was go through about 50 regiments, focusing on those where I knew they encountered Confederates in engagements, knew men had been taken captive. And I could find, again, these really intriguing instances of testimony um, that just gave you know a little teeny hint of what was going on going on. Men like James Ottaway, who was captured in Alabama in 1864, and then held by a rebel captain on his plantation and not able to escape until December 1865. So this, again, gave voice to some of the experiences these men were going through that just white prisoners of war did not have to deal with. That these men could be reclaimed, they could put be put to enslavement forms by the military. And so this was what I was dealing with. You know, these kinds of snippets of testimony and, and evidence. And from there, I was able to find pension files. Pension files is where I was able to really reconstruct these experiences and understand beyond the quantitative level, the qualitative uh, discussion of what was happening in captivity. 
So I was able to collect more than 360 pensions out of more than 715 that I identified coming from Black POWs who survived captivity, gave voice to their experiences. The majority are speaking to debilities such as wounds and chronic diseases. They're trying to get a pension from the federal government after the war. So it really depended on which men you were engaging with, what he was saying about his particular form of captivity. And so by casting this wide net, Taking these 300 plus accounts, uh, I basically started to reconstruct a more holistic view of what was going on with Black POWs. And I came to find that more than 2,300 men thus far, that's 2,300 and counting, I've not stopped this research, it's ongoing, but over the course of looking through 50 regiments, I found more than 2,300 men who were taken captive. And the vast majority of those men were actually taken captive in Alabama and Georgia in 1864. The vast majority of those men taken captive in Alabama and Georgia, in fact, survived captivity. Uh, out of the total 2,300 that I've identified so far, I've determined approximately 1,500 of those men, around 70% or so, managed to survive captivity. So this narrative of atrocity, of death in the immediate aftermath of battle, really necessary to understand. But on the other side of it, we also have to understand survival. We have to understand what these men do in captivity, how they pushed back against their circumstances. And so by looking at uh, regiments like the 44th, uh, the regiments like the 106th, the 110th, and the 111th, I came to find some really important details. Notably that Georgia and Alabama were the site of the largest captures of Black prisoners of war. In Dalton, Georgia, in October 1864, more than 600 men were taken prisoner from the 44th United States Colored Infantry. Uh, around the same time at Sulphur Trestle in Alabama and Athens, Alabama, another several hundred men were taken captive, totaling more than 1,200 men total. The vast majority of these men moved through the states of Georgia and Alabama, further and further south. And you can see a logic taking place here. The moving of men away from the Union lines, bringing them further south, and placing them in areas like Mobile, like Selma, Alabama, like Corinth, Mississippi, uh, places throughout Georgia, uh, including mines in St. Clair, that basically used them as enslaved labor, removed them from the reach of the Union Army, and put them to work basically supporting the Confederate war effort. And this is why we really need to understand what happened to these men and what they had to say about it. And this is corroborated by newspaper accounts as well. That the majority of these men, hundreds, and at least uh, 616 men were held throughout Georgia and Alabama, and definitely more than that. I'm still trying to confirm all of the various events, but uh, the vast majority of those 1,200 men were held in Mobile and in nearby regions. And what they did there was basically be put to work. Uh, the Confederacy advertised for their presence much as they would have done for a runaway enslaved person in the antebellum period, basically notifying enslavers in surrounding areas that these men were at work in places like Mobile and that they could receive compensation for their labor. But the Confederacy was in dire straits by late 1864. And so we see the necessity uh, discussed by people like Major General um, Dabney Morey, who was the lead of the uh, Department of the Gulf in the Confederacy, his conversations with Chief Engineer Victor von Schellehe of Mobile, basically discussing how the fortifications in Mobile had been nearly destroyed by Admiral Farragut coming in in August 1863 and the desperate need that they had for enslaved labor to repair these fortifications. The desperate need for enslaved labor to basically maintain these war efforts, maintain railroads, maintain the very infrastructure and lifeblood of the Confederate war effort. And you see this taking place throughout the newspapers as well as in these accounts by these men, what they were going through, what they experienced and how they spoke about it. And so we have to really reckon with the fact that the centers of captivity, where these men were effectively enslaved by the Confederate military, they're put to work in Georgia and Alabama. Georgia and Alabama are the key sites of incarceration and enslavement for Black POWs. And that these men were able to survive in part because they showed themselves being of worth and value to the Confederacy. So this emphasis on racial hatred, on atrocity that took place in the midst of battle, didn't necessarily hold true several weeks after capture, and that these men 
actually had a very good chance of survival once they reached these carceral sites, as I, as I call them. So hundreds of men uh, testified that they were forced to labor on these works, forts like Spanish Fort, Fort Gaines as carpenters, worked as blacksmiths in the city, worked as general labor. Hundreds were forced to labor throughout Georgia, Alabama, and even Mississippi primarily on burial duty, on repairing and tearing up railroads. And in so doing, we see these communications between commanders like Dabney Morey and generals like John Bell Hood and Nathan Bedford Forrest, showing that they are intentionally capturing these men and putting them to work on behalf of the Confederate war effort. And so really reckoning with what black prisoners of war had to say, I could find testimonies that would not have been present in the official records and not present in these trial records either. A man named Private Abram Rawls discussed in detail how General John Bell Hood took more than 600 men from the 44th captive, took them to Gadsden, Alabama, and basically put these men in a field uh, at the outskirts of the city, which you can kind of see towards the back of this depiction of Gadsden here on this map, and basically have them sit there and be potentially reclaimed by former enslavers. This happened to Private Abram Rawls of the 44th. His former enslaver, a former House of Representatives to the Confederacy, Dr. John P. Rawls, basically reclaimed him from General John Bell Hood, took him back home to Center, Alabama, and put him back to work as an enslaved man on the Rawls farm. And basically, Abram Rawls had to navigate his way through captivity until he was able to escape again. As many as 250 men may have been either sold or recovered by uh, former enslavers, according to the testimonies of men like Abram Rawls, men like John Leach, the uh, officers who I showed had given testimony in the official records before. And there's still a lot of uncertainty surrounding how many men survived, how many men died in captivity, and what exactly happened to them. But having these pension files and first-person testimonies really allows us to reconstruct that the experience of being a Black prisoner of war was highly contingent, it was risky, it was dangerous, and these men had to navigate basically these processes of enslavement, whether they were put to work by the military, whether they were reclaimed by former enslavers, or whether they were able to escape and make it back to Union lines, like these officers of the 44th who I previously mentioned. And so what I've come to find is that Black prisoners of war had a significant written culture that just had not been tapped into prior to the last 10 or so years. Uh, and basically the visual culture that we've had to work with has been quite limited because these men are intentionally returned into the enslaved population by the Confederacy. We have a, a picture of this man Hubbard, Breyer, Pry, Hubbard Pryor, excuse me, from the 44th, same regiment as Abram Rawls. And this is a famous photo depicting essentially the effect of joining the Union Army on a former enslaved man, basically showing this impact of a uniform, of becoming essentially a United States citizen through military service. But for the Confederacy, they wanted to reverse this process. They wanted to take the man in the uniform pictured here and return him on the level of the slave, basically unmake the soldier and remake the enslaved man. And this is what happened to Abram Rawls. His enslaver specifically stripped him of his blue uniform, returned him to a state of enslavement, and tried to basically cow him once more, make him a fully obedient man. But Abram Rawls, much like his comrades, was only ever putting up a front of obedience, and only so long as it served him until he could once more affect his escape for good. So this up till now has been pretty much the only known photo I've been able to find of a uh, enslaved Black prisoner of war. Hubbard Pryor was also captured along with people like Abram Rawls at the 44th. Uh, he was imprisoned and held in Mobile, Alabama. But up to now, you know, there's been no photographic culture dealing with Black prisoners of war in captivity, in part because they were rendered on this level of enslavement. I was lucky enough to find, however, a depiction of a man named Richard French, his tintype, as I was going through the pension files in the National Archives of DC. And I think this is a powerful statement of what kind of visual culture we do have to resurrect when it comes to Black prisoners of war, which is survival. 
which is the post-war experience, that this man lived to be of old age, that he made it to the 20th century, that he lived in freedom for the remainder of his life, and that he was able to basically leave behind this significant record of his existence, not only as a soldier, but as a captive of war, as an enslaved captive of war, and then again as a man who became free and was able to affect this freedom uh, in key, key ways. So this is what I have been trying to do with my research on Black prisoners of war, really reckoning with recentering our focus on the Deep South, on Georgia, on Alabama, with reckoning with the importance of places like Mobile, places like Columbus, where at least several Black prisoners of war were held for some time during the Civil War, and really trying to reckon with the realities of applying the slavery status to soldiers because of their skin color. The fact that they were Black men basically rendered them property within Confederate boundaries, but these men always defied that category wherever they could. And so with that, I will end my presentation, and I just want to say thank you so much again for having us here and for this opportunity.